Hello, I'm Ben Wattenberg. Until recently, assisted suicide was illegal, but court decisions have affirmed the right of terminally ill patients to receive suicide help from doctors. Are we making dying more humane, or are we entering a brave new world of state-sanctioned euthanasia? Joining us to sort through the conflict and consensus are scholars from across the country. Leon Cass, professor in the Committee on Social Thought and the College at the University of Chicago, a physician and author of The Hungry Soul. Daniel Callahan, director and co-founder of the Hastings Center in Westchester County, New York, and the author of The Troubled Dream of Life in Search of a Peaceful Death. Stephen Jameson, professor of social and behavioral sciences at the University of California at San Francisco, and author of Final Acts of Love, Families, Friends, and Assisted Dying, and Jonathan Turley, law professor at George Washington University in Washington, D.C., and founder of the Project for Older Prisoners. The topic before this house, Is There a Right to Die? This week on Think Tank. For thousands of years, doctors have taken the Hippocratic Oath, which says, first, do no harm. Now the interpretation of the famous oath seems to be changing. A recent Gallup poll reveals that 64% of Americans support physician-assisted suicide for some people, and it is estimated that as many as 25% of practicing doctors have admitted to quietly helping people die. While advances in modern medicine make it possible for people to live longer and more actively, frightening declines in the quality of life are still commonplace. Recent court decisions have held that competent, terminally ill patients have the right to end their lives with a doctor's assistance. But critics ask, what defines competence? How terminal or painful does an illness have to be to sanction doctor-assisted suicide? And would such a law set society on a slippery slope toward coerced suicide, euthanasia, and a new medical specialty, killing? Supporters of assisted suicide say terminally ill people should have control over their lives and their deaths. Such control would allow them to die with dignity. Uh, Jonathan Turley, where do you stand on the issue of doctor-assisted suicide? Well, ultimately, the question of doctor-assisted suicide depends upon our definition of the right to die. Doctor assistance is a derivative right, if there is a right in the Constitution, to the right to die. Now, restrictions to a constitutional right have to be reasonable. To say that there can be no assistance of a physician in the exercise of a constitutional right would be analogous to depriving a woman of the benefit of a physician in an abortion. Okay. Stephen Jameson. I believe that only by uh, legislation or by uh, firm guidelines that are established by the courts can physicians uh, actually be able to provide uh, to themselves uh, a moral justification for deciding when and how a patient uh, should be helped to die. Uh, Daniel Callahan. Uh, I think people are terribly concerned about dying, and rightfully so these days. <laughs> you might say uh, that, right. But I think, but I, it seems to me that the solution of physician-assisted suicide is is worse than the than the, the the problem it's meant to solve. It's it's going to have enormous social impacts. I think mainly of a of a harmful kind. Uh, I don't believe there there's certainly a right to certain kinds of care in dying, but we're all going to die. It seems to me to make no sense even to talk about a right to die. The question to be is is what right what we give physicians to help us in our dying, and here I don't think physicians should have that kind of power. Leon Cass. You know, I also think that uh, however helpful this might be in individual cases, as a matter of social policy, this will be a disaster. It will turn the healing profession into a profession that it technically dispenses death. The relief of suffering will come to mean the elimination of the sufferer, and all kinds of vulnerable people who are already marginalized in the healthcare system will find themselves eliminated. What is the legal situation uh, of a, a right to die? Is there such a constitutional right? 
Well, that's a salient question because we have two Court of Appeals both acknowledging for the first time that there is a constitutional footing for this right to die. Do they cite a, uh, a provision? Well, that's the rub. Uh, unfortunately, they cite different rationales. Uh, the Ninth Circuit believes that this right is based upon due process, while the Second Circuit vehemently disagrees with now, the now Ninth Circuit. Minute, what, explain that. Why would the, the due process clause provide a rationale? The Ninth Circuit believes that this is a traditional liberty interest that the Constitution protects and the government cannot deprive you of. The Second Circuit disagrees with that and says that actually they don't believe it is such a traditional right because there's no, there's no traditional support or recognition of that right. But they feel that it is a constitutional right nonetheless under the Equal Protection Clause. Now the reason for that is that the Second Circuit was bothered that people who were in a vegetative state had a right to have medical assistance removed and thereby death brought on by the act of a physician. And the Second Circuit said you can't treat people differently. People who are cognitive, who are not in a vegetative stage, um, are being denied that same right. And you can't treat two similarly situated people in different ways under the Equal Protection Clause. Uh, Leon, is, is pulling the plug on, on someone who is in a vegetative state, is that the same as doctor-assisted suicide? Uh, uh, absolutely not. It seems to me medicine always uh, is uh, on the presumption that there's a possibility of saving a person or of restoring them to health will try many kinds of therapy but after a while when it becomes clear that the therapy is futile that the patient is go not going to get any better these interventions are regarded as useless and burdensome additions to the already sad end of a life and people desist from a trial of treatment that has not worked um, the intent is in fact to no longer interfere with the dying process and to allow a person to live out whatever Whereas in the other case, uh, the direct administration of drugs, either by a physician or given to a patient, intends death directly, and it is uh, a decisive difference. There's a bright line between these two things, traditionally and I think ethically and, and legally. Are courts the right place to decide this matter? I don't think they're necessarily the best forums. Un unhappily, they're often the only forums we have in this country for dealing with difficult topics. I wish that this, these courts had, uh, had, had simply refused to take on these cases, uh, ask, let, let the issues be debated more within the states and not sort of, so to speak, do an end run on public opinion and public debate, although, which I think is still relatively immature on this topic. Although I respect the point, but the, the, it, it seems to me that uh, the ox is gored the other way as well because the public opinion, if left to public opinion, most states would in fact have these laws. The courts are serving a function, I think, for those against the right to die in putting a break, essentially, on this movement towards the right to die and trying to define in that forum what is a fair and reasonable sort of procedure. I think one of my concerns is uh, suicide is not against the law now and we treat the person who commits suicide uh, as, as somebody deserving our pity. We feel sorry about the situation. We work to prevent suicide. Uh, but it seems to me that these laws are really saying suicide is, it going, is to be an acceptable way of dealing with the, the, the difficulties and suffering of life and death. And it seems to me we're going to change the status of suicide uh, and, and legitimate it and elevate it, and I think that would be one of the most disastrous outcomes. Well, the court, in making its decision, one of the things that it did say is that it is in the state's interest to protect citizens against um, harmful acts to themselves. It said the exception here in the case of, of, assist, mm -hmm. of assisted suicide is that when individuals are indeed terminally ill or suffering mm -hmm. intolerably, but intolerable suffering was a primary factor in there, that uh, the the suffering itself takes precedence over the state's um, right to, uh, to protect its citizens. But I also agree with you that, that there is a problem here that needs to be addressed. And the problem is, what is the message that's going out before the people? And that's why I believe that very strict controls are necessary that make this an extraordinary decision, uh, that elevate this to a, to a level of seriousness so that it does not become uh, just the expectation that this is the way in which an individual patient is to end his or her life. Yeah, but um, everybody talks about the desirability and the need for strict controls, but uh, uh, I think it's, if you think about it a little bit, you can see that it's going to be impossible to control this. The bright line that we have is clear, um, but um, 
all of the important terminology, terminally ill, voluntary, knowledgeable, those things are very ambiguous. Although, Leon, uh, I, I, I agree with you that there's a danger there and there's a slippery slope that we may be on. But the, pr the first question I think we have to answer is, is there a constitutional right to die? And from that, we then balance that right against what are reasonable restrictions. I don't think it's necessarily relevant as to the first question to debate how difficult this constitutional right will be. Well, we don't do that with other constitutional what, rights. What, what's the foundation of this constitutional right? Well, there's actually, a, I, I think that it's I, more I've consistent. The, I've, I've read the, the documents. Um, well, I, I, think it's more, I think it's more consistent, moving away from these two cases. It's more consistent to have a right to die given the other rights that we have. We've recognized a right of privacy over your body. That involves the right of privacy over what will become a child uh, and where the state's interest in the th third trimester is great. This does not involve a third party in, the, in, the, in that trimester. It involves a single party. Where do we get the right of physicians to become our agents? What kind of a constitution? Where is that constitutional right? Uh, well, it's not. I, I think mm -hmm. the focus on the physician's right is, is misplaced. The question is, if we accept that mm -hmm. oh, there's a right to die, the question then becomes mm -hmm. whether other restrictions are depriving the, mm -hmm. the, in, the use of that right. Mm -hmm. In the same way that mm -hmm. if you recognize a right to abortion, the, the Supreme Court has to then look at what a state can do that interferes with that right. Now, that, that is when we do the balancing, well, and I think that we have to try. Well, um, it seems to me that um, the liberty interest uh, that the Constitution protects uh, is uh, a liberty to uh, not to have one's body invaded. What you're talking about is a right to become dead by assistance if necessary, and that flies in the face of everything that liberal politics stands for, which begins liberal with the right, small, liberal small L, L. L. the defined, liberal. which is the fundamental thing, is the inalienable right to life. Just as a matter of practical uh, thought, if somebody wants to commit suicide, is it that hard to do? I mean, without a doctor? Not for 6,000 people a year, it's not. I mean, well, at least 6,000 people a year commit suicide, and those are, the, those are the identified ones. The actual number is less important, I think, and I think we all agree on that, than the philosophical question. I don't, I'm not comfortable with the fact that we have thousands of people committing suicide in, in, with probably unnecessary pain every year in possibly endangering other people as we sort of have this sort of noble lie. Uh, well, there, there's, there's, some, there's some peculiar ironies here on, on the few s surveys I've seen of physicians in different specialties. Cancer physicians are, are the least interested in physician-assisted suicide. It's often physicians who don't directly treat. It's as if the closer they are to patients, the less they're interested in this. <laughs> uh, and and well, I, I well, think well, also there's the, the, the other uh, irony, I suspect, is that uh, we, we know that something like close to 90% of people who do commit suicide are not doing it because of, of medical suffering. They've usually had a history of some kind of, of, of mental stress or mental health problems, and it doesn't mean they were crazy, but that kind of history is there, and I suppose many of us think, my gosh, we can do a lot better with those people than offering them physician-assisted suicide. But the question, Dan, that, that's not being addressed there is that those are known suicides, and that most of the cases of, of assisted suicide that presently go on are uh, dealt with as natural deaths. I, is there a, an official definition of terminal illness? I mean, is it a day, a week, a year? Or uh, um, well, I mean, uh, alas, I, I hate to disillusion you all, but we are all terminally ill. In effect, is that right? So how well, do you? Well, I think we have the government to blame for this uh, in some instances. For, for dying? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, for, there's there's for a new one. Us. Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> for giving us sometimes a, a six-month limitation. Uh, on this in terms of uh, shifting over to uh, Medicare, Medicaid and so forth uh, and hospice payments and, and, and uh, so forth. Six months is typically what is used. It's absolutely it's, so in other words, I, I, if a person is going to die in theory in seven months, you would not make it legal for a doctor to assist in his suicide? Well, I, I don't have any say in that. No, but I mean, your, your <laughs> view and your opinion. In my view, I think that this should be uh, a, a, an action of last resort, close to, uh, close to a period of natural death as possible. Who's to, who's to judge now once you start on this road? What counts as uh, unbearable suffering? The thing becomes subjective. Uh, why should six months rather than seven or five years? Uh, but you know, um, and uh, once you start here, none of these allegedly firm definitional markers can hold. 
The Dutch have done an experiment for us in this, in this subject. They've set forth allegedly firm guidelines. Uh, the medical profession set it down, the laws looked the other way, and those guidelines are violated wholesale. Um, enormous numbers of people put to death without their consent. But, you know, Leon, one of the benefits of the Dutch system is it brings it out into the open. I mean, the people we're most concerned with are people who are not ill, people who are depressed, for example. That's a tremendous danger, and I share you're concerned about that. Because there, there, there are me, so many I, new drugs and uh, drugs coming online all the time dealing with, with even depression the, and for depression. But I don't but, I mean, believe the Dutch situation has brought it out in the open even there, since some 50 percent of the physician by the government's own data don't report that they do it. Well, they don't report they do the voluntary cases, much less the non-voluntary. No, I, I, I accept that. I accept so that criticism, but I think that... It's not open, in short, in Holland either. I mean, but I, I, I think I, that I, the hold, value... Let me just stop here for a minute. Mm -hmm. I, I, are, are there documented instances of non-documented, I guess you'd have to call it killing, by physicians? The government I, I, itself I, I, in Holland yeah. did a study in the early 90s called the Remeling Study, uh, where they found at least a thousand non, what they call non-voluntary uh, cases. That's what I meant. Not, people who did not, but non, non people who, who did not uh, request uh, a, a euthanasia. Some, some may have said something early in their lives, but there was a large category of people who were still how, competent. How many people did they estimate? One thousand a year. A thousand compared to twenty-three hundred voluntary. There were a thousand non-voluntary. So in short, something like one third of the cases in Holland. But there's a third figure mm -hmm. here, and the third figure is there's a lot of people who mm -hmm. will have gone to those physicians and discussed this possibility. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems that I have is I think that people who are considering this step should talk to people like you. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I would want you to be my doctor, I'd want you to be mm -hmm. my friend, mm -hmm. and I would want to talk to you about this. Right now, we have this, this barrier. So we have incredibly desperate people mm -hmm. who are taking desperate choices oh, I, alone. Look, I think, it's, I think what you say is very good. I think that mm -hmm. very often a request for assisted suicide is in fact an opportunity to discuss the whole dying process. It's a plea for help. It might be a sign of depression. And that the cancer mm -hmm. doctors that Dan talks about uh, will tell you this over and over again. Once they reassure the patient that pain can be dealt with, that they're not going to be abandoned, that there are lots of things that, they can, that can be done, the request disappears. And it seems to me it that is, the real the, it, the is request pain, is pain generally controllable in yes, these severe it is. instances. Uh, and the hospice the hospice movement has really done us a great service by showing how this can be managed. The profession, which has been shamefully negligent to this point, is now I think beginning to come around. The medical profession. The medical profession is finally beginning to come around. I share your concerns, but I also share concerns over the Sloan Kettering report that was released last December. The study that showed that even when uh, we supposedly have a system where we can control all but maybe five to ten percent of, of uh, intractable terminal pain, we still have uh, a vast number of these patients and, and many other patients as well who are controllable who are not receiving adequate palliative mm -hmm. care at the end of life and recent studies that show that physicians are not referring their terminally ill patients oh. to hospice this they are not providing them the the well-grounded experience but you suggest that physician assisted suicide is not likely to encourage that kind of referral i don't believe well, i think that I, I i would probably be uh, yelled at for saying this but mm -hmm. i think that uh, the hospices of this country uh, should see uh, assisted death as as one very small part of an option of con of a continuum of care in this but, in this society. You know, um, give, uh, given the um, the immense economic pressures uh, on the healthcare system, given the fact that many people don't have a doctor that they know and talk to, given the fact that all kinds of people are being thrown out of hospital for inadequate coverage, once you make assisted suicide a therapeutic option to be offered to people. Palliative care is going to dry up because it's expensive. Okay, uh, let me ask something. You guys, with all due respect, keep saying how you share each other's concern, and you share this, and you share that, uh, and everybody's uh, <laughs> sharing everything. It's, it's all very, cuddly. <laughs> it's all very cuddly and warm. What, what, what's the disagreement? What are you afraid of, Leon? Hundreds of thousands of vulnerable people: the poor, the uneducated, the partly demented uh, minorities who don't have anybody to speak for them are going to be encouraged to take advantage of this option to begin with. 
Um, you that, mean that the state uh, that, that it's the physicians con control the information. One can present the prognosis in such a way and make assisted su make suicide appear attractive, and the economic pressures to do so are enormous. It, because so, of the cost of, of, of the, the last be, year or so. Of, yeah, because of, of the care. cost, because physicians and others get tired of taking care of people that they can't cure with some kind of technological home run. Um, the profession, the medical profession, will be profoundly corrupted once it becomes a death-dealing profession, whether directly or indirectly. It would be like saying, look, um, there are some people who want to drown themselves. Uh, let's turn it over to the lifeguards to do it, because people trust lifeguards. What would it mean if the medical profession becomes a profession known to be a death-dispensing profession? You can spin this as death delivering or pain relieving, that's rhetorical, but what is practical is that people are committing suicide, people are taking this choice. We have to decide whether they have a right to control their own body. Now the question you presented before, which was where do you find the right of somebody to commit suicide, that's not the view of, of the people on the other side. Their view is where does the government get the right upon which to control my life? Whether I agree with a constitutional right is not my question. My question is whether individuals have the right to choose here. Then Leon and I can try to make that, to convince them to take the right choice. But the issue of the constitutional right cannot be subject to our visceral reaction. Um, let me ask a one word question or uh, drop a hockey puck uh, and it is Kevorkian. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, it's interesting to see with Kevorkian and an awful lot of the problems. I believe if we legalize physician assisted suicide, we'll have lots of Kevorkians around. That is to say, we'll see, with, as we've seen with Kevorkian, uh, very casual, sloppy counseling, uh, looking into patients' backgrounds. Uh, people, he now takes people who are not dying but are simply suffering, by their account, suffering. Uh, it seems to me he is a, a wonderful model of where things are likely no, to go. We have and a, we know we there are large. Now. Well, and we have many. But we'll, we'll have many. I think we'll have many buccaneers in this area. We, the, we'll find out who are who are the Kevorkian-minded physicians. Part of this, to do part this, of this, so. uh, this AIDS study in San Francisco mm -hmm. that was released at the Vancouver AIDS Symposium, uh, there was one physician who responded uh, in terms of the number of, of assisted mm -hmm. suicides that he had helped in, and that had that number was over 100. And I am certain that that although that is extremely rare, mm -hmm. and the Kevorkians are extremely rare here without guidelines, without opportunities for mm -hmm. second opinions, without opportunities for, mm -hmm. for the intervention of mental health professionals, mm -hmm. and perhaps without the intervention of, of bioethics committees at, uh, in local hospitals mm -hmm. and regional levels, uh, these kinds of actions will continue to occur and will expand because no one is being prosecuted in this country for this action now, well, and yet I, I no one has any guidelines. The difficulty is, I, I don't believe guidelines can work <coughs> because we have doctor-patient privacy and confidentiality. There is no way to monitor the transactions that take place between doctor and patient. You can write wonderful guidelines, but the question is, short of having a policeman standing at every encounter of doctor and patients, there is no way to break through that privacy to actually but make these regulations work. Well, That's the guidelines, exactly what Holland shows Yes, us. but the guidelines can at least provide medical associations with the tools in, in mm -hmm. which they can then educate their members mm -hmm. as, to, as to the proper physician-patient relationship around the end of life. But then, then don't then call them educational tools and don't call them the regulation and the protection, the protection. of patients. But uh, it's what, unlikely what that they're going to get more Kevorkians. Uh, I mean, I mean, Kevorkians like, sort of like well, a bathtub gin of doctors. I mean, you only go to a Kevorkian uh, 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 when you've got no choice. I but. use that by meaning the very permissive physician who is likely to the physician who does a hundred. That's what's likely to happen. We'll move. Everyone will find that physician, and there will be some. What well, about there, there that idea that, that I believe is uh, uh, ascribed to former Governor Lamb of Colorado, the so-called duty to die. It, it is his case that the cost of medical expenses in the last, what, six months of life are so enormous that they are bankrupting the whole social welfare system. And I believe he has used the phrase, the duty to die. Mm. I, is this, uh, is that what you're concerned about? Well, I, I do think that um, uh, the society uh, has uh, not really come to terms with uh, what you said earlier, that we all have a terminal illness and that uh, mortality is finally no disgrace and that we would do better if we ceased in all cases trying to fight against it, much as we love life and love the lives of our loved ones. 
And it seems to me that the quest for bodily immortality is the ultimate aim of the current medical uh, project, and that it's foolish. Um, but to say that we ought to think about setting limits, Dan is in fact the authority on this subject, he's written beautifully on this matter. Uh, while we should think about setting limits to this project, we don't do it by deciding that certain individuals have lives that are not worth living. Uh, the, the Germans, the, the Nazi regime showed us what, what, what happens when you start thinking in, in, in those terms. Um, you protect in a way the sanctity of life while trying to educate the public about the limits of trying to live indefinitely. Uh, it's a hard balancing act, but I think so, that's what so we should do. So you are in favor of I'm in pulling favor the of plug. pulling the plug. I'm in favor of giving adequate pain medication even at the increased risk of death, but I'm firmly opposed to any act that deliberately intends the death of the patient. Okay, that, that will have to be the uh, final word. Thank you, uh, Leon Cass, Jonathan Turley, Daniel Callahan, and Stephen Jameson for Think Tank. I'm Ben Wattenberg. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.